Hey guys, welcome to Data Track, your one-stop channel for all the data science and machine learning updates. Conversational AI like ChatGPT has gained a lot of popularity in recent times because of its amazing capabilities and commendable command over the language. The user can get a lot many tasks done through ChatGPT by giving the right instructions or prompt. In this video, we will look at the technology behind ChatGPT. ChatGPT model is powered by GPT-3 which is Generative Pre-trained Transformer. Why is GPT-3 so powerful? How GPT-3 is trained to get ChatGPT using some amazing engineering enhancements and clever tricks. We will look into that as well. And finally, once the user gives an input to the ChatGPT, the response comes, right? That flow in input to output, what happens under the hood, we will look into that as well. So let's get started. First of all, we will start with the exploration of GPT-3 model. Language models like GPT-3, which is Generative Pre-trained Transformer, have revolutionized modern deep learning applications for NLP, leading to the widespread publicity and recognition. Most of the technical novelty of GPT-3 is based on its predecessors, which are GPT and GPT-2. The GPT models are based on the transformer architecture, which is a type of neural network that has shown to be very effective in natural language tasks such as language generation, translation and sentiment analysis. This is the transformer architecture which consists of encoder and the decoder. The encoder consists of multi-head retention and normalization layers and uh, the output of the encoder becomes the input to the decoder and decoder also has multi-headed attention and normalization layer but it has multi-headed masked attention layer. We will look into that in more details in the later section and the output of decoder is softmax uh, uh, layer which emits the output probability. So basically the output is nothing but a probability distribution across words that which, which word will have the highest uh, chances of occurring next. We will look into the transformer architecture in more details in the upcoming slides but this is the transformer architecture which powers GPT. And also GPT, the G stands for generative. What is the difference between generative versus discriminative AI? Generative AI is a type of artificial intelligence that involves using algorithm to generate new data such as images, music or text. While discriminative AI on the other hand is focused on classifying or labeling data. So, uh, given the input, some new type of data is generated, which could be the translation, images, music, text. That's why it's called generative AI, while discriminative AI is most on the discriminator part. It has to find the right classification that whether this uh, data points belong to the class X or class Y. So, it's more on the discriminative part and generative AI generates new type of data. Moving on, further understanding the GPT-3 in more details and also the GPT models uh, as a whole. GPT models are pre-trained on large amount of text data which allows them to learn patterns and relationships in language that can be used to generate coherent and contextually relevant text. The pre-training is done during a, uh, using a self-supervised learning approach which is autoregressive in nature where the model is trained to predict the next word in the text. This approach allows the model to learn the underlying structure and context of language which is used to generate text in a coherent and uh, uh, contextually relevant manner. So basically how the GPT-3 model is trained, uh, first of all the pre-training happens on the entire internet data where it happens through a self-supervised or you can also say auto-regressive way. Why self-supervised? Because given the sentence it will take one word one word at a time and predict, try to predict the next word. Then next two word, then it will take the two words and try to predict the third word. And then it will take one, two, three, four word, predict the next word. So the dog sat, the dog sat down, the dog sat down, end of a statement that is give reach the end of the token. So in this way, the uh, training happens on entire internet data in a self-supervised or autoregressive way where the input um, is taken one word at a time to predict the next word, then next two words to predict the third word, then three words to predict the fourth word and so on. And one more thing you can see that Decoder only transformer. As I was saying, the transformer has two parts encoder and decoder. The GPT model only uses the decoder part of the transformer architecture, and there is a reason for it. The reason is this masked self attention. That's why uh, the uh, GPT model only uses decoder part of the architecture. We will look into this masked self attention in more details in the next slide. 
So now coming to the advantages of GPT architecture, we have seen that GPT architecture is very powerful because it's based on the decoder part of the transformer and it's pre-trained on a uh, huge amount of internet data in a self-supervised and auto-regressive way by predicting the next word. But let's look into more details that why is transformer so powerful and why only the decoder part of the transformer is used in the GPT architecture. So first let's look at uh, the transformer architecture. The transformer architecture is based on attention mechanism. The transformer model utilizes a powerful attention mechanism called self-attention, allowing it to focus on most relevant part of the input at each stage of the model. The, this allows the models to capture long-range dependencies and relationships between words, making it more effective in natural language processing tasks. So basically, if you see this, uh, when the four words are passed, it's passed through a self-attention layer and the self-attention layer will find the dependency of words on each other and it will find the most relevant part of the input to focus on and it makes it very powerful. Second is multi headed attention. So definitely there is this attention but there is not just one attention, there are multiple uh, heads of these attentions, multiple attentions running in parallel. So what happens because of that, because of this multi headed attention, the transformer model utilizes multi headed attention which allows the model to attend to different parts of the input simultaneously allowing it to capture more complex relationships. The third important advantage of transformer is that it has the capability to do parallel processing. The transformer model can process inputs in parallel making it more efficient and faster than the previous recurrent neural networks. So in previous recurrent neural network what used to happen the one word used to be passed at one time and then some activations used to be produced which used to go as an input along with the next word. But here you can see all the words are passed at once, all the input words are passed at once uh, through the self attention layer and uh, which makes it very fast this parallel processing and self attention will help to calculate the uh, importance of each word on the other words. But the idea is that since the model processes inputs in parallel it is more efficient and faster than the previous recurrent neural networks like LSTM and RNNs. And also one more part is layer normalization. After every attention layer, there is a uh, after every attention layer, you can see add and norms. There is a normalization layer. So what happens because of this normalization layer? It normalizes the activations between layers and stabilizes the learning process. So the learning happens in a more smoother way. So these are the advantages of transformer attention mechanism, multi-head attention, parallel processing, and layer normalization. Next, why GPT only uses the decoder part of the transformer architecture? The choice of using the decoder architecture is not arbitrary. That is, it's not random, it's because of a reason. The reason is mass retention. The mass self attention within the decoder allows the GPT to not able to look forward in the sentence while predicting the next token during pre-training. So basically we know in the pre-training, uh, first X words are shown to predict the X plus one word. So whatever is after X plus one, uh, so whatever is a, is at x plus 1 or after x plus 1 should be hi hidden. Uh, so that can be achieved through the mass retention layer. Whichever word is getting predicted at that time stem, that word and all the next set of words will be masked. And uh, using mass self attention yields an autoregressive architecture, meaning the model's output at time t is used as an input at time t plus 1, so autoregressive that can continuously predict the next token in the sequence. That's the reason why GPT uses decoder part of the transformer architecture. Next, we will look at some interesting properties of GPT models. GPT models are called foundation models. What are foundation models? Like, right? So to understand foundation models, let's first understand narrow experts. There are many deep learning systems which are narrow experts. That is, these models are trained on a very large supervised data sets such that it learns accurately to perform a specific tasks which can be classification, translation, summarization or any other detection. So depending on one of these tasks whichever the ta for whichever task the neural network is trained on it becomes a narrow expert. While GPT series moves away from the paradigm of narrow experts and rather than training or fine tuning a new model for every application which sometimes can be classification, translation, summarization, any other detection or something else, what GPT does is it's pre-trained on huge amount of data that is over entire internet using next word prediction 
and model has huge number of parameters. One GPT-3 is 175 billion parameters and GPT-4 is assumed to have trillion parameters. So two things, it is pre-trained on entire internet and secondly, it has huge number of parameters and these two things helps GPT to somehow adopt to solve numerous tasks instead of being trained on a specific task. So generic models that are used to solve many tasks as referred to foundation models and GPT series is one such foundation model. The idea is that once the pre-training is done, it can be trained on multiple tasks simultaneously. Once it can be uh, fine-tuned on classification, translation, then summarization and so on. And once the model has learned and fine-tuned on many such tasks, if any new task comes, the model has the capability to adapt to that new task as well using few sort inference. So, just a quick recap, GPT, GPT models are foundation models because once pre-trained they can be fine-tuned on multiple tasks at once and this approach mitigates the problem of data scarcity by pre-training over a large diverse data set. Additionally, these models are used or adapted to solve other tasks, avoiding constant training. And the, how is this thing achieved? That How can GPT models can perform multiple tasks? This capability is achieved by exploiting the generic input output structure by providing inputs like this. For example, when we have to do translation, we will say translate this sentence to English. And when we have to do summarization, we will do summarize the following document, right? And as I was saying, since GPT-3 and uh, above series of models are uh, foundation models, which, are, which can be fine-tuned on multiple tasks at once, and if any new task appears, any new type of description of task the user gives, they are able to adapt very fast using these few set inferences. So what is zero and few sort inferences? Suppose the user has described a task to be performed that I want to do this, okay? For example, translate English to French and the model will be able to do it because it is it, because uh, it was pre-trained on huge internet and it's a very big model and it has been fine-tuned on multiple tasks and new task it, uh, if appears it adapts. So it is able to even do a new task using just the task description and sometimes just the task descriptions uh, becomes little difficult right so what we can do we can give few examples also like for example translate english to french for example c hotel is lutre de mar similarly what is the translation of other words which will go in the user prompt so giving few examples also we can teach it and also we can uh, teach it by not just one example but few examples and what happens in this few zero and few sort of inference the model is not fine-tuned the model is just the weights remains there just that we are uh, properly describing the task and giving some examples that what has to be done in this new task and the model adapts this chart very beautifully shows that why gpt3 models and above are able to do that they are able to do that because of their large size you can see as the size increases the ability to adapt to new tasks also adapt, increases. Here 10 to power 0 means 1. With just one sort, that is one example, the GPT-3 model will, with 175 billion parameters has the highest accuracy and it keeps on increasing at, as we do few sort. That is, if we give more examples, few sort inference, it improves, the accuracy improves more. Even if with just one example, accuracy is good and highest for the biggest model of 175 billion parameters. And, and even without and giving any example, just giving the task description, the bigger models are able to give decent accuracy. So, so that's the uniqueness about GPT-3 and above models. Now, what is ChatGPT? Uh, how what is it and how it's trained? So, ChatGPT is a variant of GPT-3 model, especially designed for chatbot application. It has been trained on a large data set of conversational text. So it is able to generate response that are more appropriate uh, for use in a chatbot context, which is question answer manner. GPT-3 is the base large language model and chat GPT is the instruction tuned large language model. Uh, that is on taking the base model GPT-3, it's been tuned further to get chat GPT. So it's the variant of GPT-3, which has been designed for uh, conversational uh, text. So how it's trained is there are three steps. In step one, we take the GPT model and fine tune it on user prompt and the labeler created response in a supervised way. For example, the labeler may have created a prompt for uh, like explain reinforcement learning to a six year old. This is this becomes kind of prompt or question. 
and answer is uh, the labeler would have already created the answers as well and the gpt model will be fine tuned to emit this type of answers and gpt is a like um, probabilistic model so it will learn to emit probabilities of words uh, or which were given in the labeler's output to be higher right the probability of them to be higher so in first step the fine tuning happens on user prompt and labeler created responses which can be question answers now in the second step chat gpt generates probability distributions over the vocabulary of words indicating the likelihood of each word being the next word in the response right so given context and prompt so basically the chat gpt has uh, or, or any gpt model is a probabilistic model it will just uh, once it has been uh, the fine tuning happens it will start predicting uh, the probability distribution of the words and what the label would have given in response those kind of words will have higher probability but it, still it will be a probability distribution since the output is a probability distribution of across words and we can sample words from it there can be multiple outputs possible right because we are sampling from the probability distributions of the word and definitely the words the next word which has highest probability of occurring they will have more chances to be sampled but because of the probability distribution there are chances that uh, answers may differ so chat gpt generates a probability distribution over the vocabulary of words indicating the likelihood of each word being the next word in the response given context and prompt and context and prompt here as prompt uh, context is what is as it has generated till now and prompt is the question explain reinforcement learning to 6 year old the next word is sampled from the distribution and this phase of sampling continues till termination token is reached since sampling is done to predict the next word multiple responses are possible the labeler what they do is out of this let's say there are four responses right one response a b c d the labeler will further rank the response from best to worst that which was the best response and which was the worst this ranked data is used to train a reward model to automate even the ranking process so we know how the ranker ranks and that process is also automated using a model to uh, this ranking is automated to be used in the next step so we have seen the first two steps in first steps uh, just the GPT model is fine tuned on question answers and these question answers are uh, uh, created by the labeler. In the second phase, what is ha what happens? Uh, since uh, GPT is a probabilistic model, uh, the, the next word is sampled from the distribution. So it may be possible in sampling process, multiple responses are possible. Every time we try to get a response, different responses may come because of the probability distribution uh, across words. Now labeler will rank these uh, multiple responses which was the good and which was the worst and we will train a model on that as well which can learn this ranking process that how the labeler is ranking something as good and bad which will use in the third uh, step third step even further betters the model through reinforcement learning so fine tuning is the happening the ranking of these outputs is happening and um, these two are combined in the third step by a layer of reinforcement learning which further betters the approach as model generates multiple responses the reward model ranks the response given the prompt and context the ppo which is proximal policy optimization it's a type of reinforcement learning algorithm ensures the model exploits the learned probabilistic distribution but also sometimes explores in search of better and more creative responses so what happens is uh, the model is learning the probability distribution most of the times it will try to sample a word which is more uh, pro pro possible to occur but once in a while it will also try to explore in search of even better response right so uh, ppo allows to do it that is the trade off between exploration and exploitation most of the time exploit but sometimes explore also what if we can get a better response what if the model is able to learn better and ppo uh, also ensures that this uh, exploration is not completely wild but it's more in a controlled way uh, the ppo is a powerful and effective way to ensure the new policies stay close to the old policy controlled exploration keeping divergence of old and new policy in check while still allowing adaptive learning in complex environments so uh, so yeah that's it sometimes the responses will explore but still it won't explore a lot for example given a question uh, word xyz has low probability but some other word which is very low probability that won't be explored 
there will be some exploration but in a controlled way that is what ppo does proximal policy uh, optimization which is a type of reinforcement learning so yes that's the whole process fine tuning on question answers and uh, multiple responses which can be generated due to the probabilistic nature of the model are ranked by a labeler and what the labeler ranks that is also learned by a model uh, so that this can be used in the third step which is the reinforcement learning in reinforcement learning what happens it explores and exploits and how good that exploration is how will the overall uh, training process know it will know through the model which was trained in the previous step which knows how to rank these responses right so what will happen some prompt will be given some response will be generated it will be a trade off between exploit and explore and how good that is that will happen ranked through the ranking model which was trained in the uh, second step which will tell how good the response was and this will go uh, but uh, it was if it was a bad response then there will be more uh, weight updates if it was pretty good then there will be uh, less weight updates depending on whichever direction it has to to better so in this way the continuous training ha keeps happening and the chat gpt model is what we obtain now i will talk about one more thing there is also a temperature parameter if you see the open ai playground you can change the temperature parameter and even the version which microsoft has productionized microsoft bing chat has three uh, uh, options most creative more balanced and more precise in more creative the temperature parameter is high uh, in more balanced it's low and in more precise it's lowest so what is this temperature parameter how can it change the creativity so that is what we will see next the temperature parameter is applied to the probability distribution to adjust the level of randomness and creativity we know that the final output comes through uh, a soft max layer right the final output will come out of this soft max layer so uh, temperature is a parameter uh, which is there in that soft max layer instead of doing a vanilla soft max we also divide it by t which is the temperature parameter now a higher temperature results in more unpredictable and creative response and the lower temperature value results in more predictable and conservative response so why does it that happen so let's understand this formula this is just the soft max formula which will find the probability of each word uh, uh, given my vocabulary to appear next given the context and the user prompt so if we see the soft max formula it has been one temperature parameter has been added t is the temperature parameter and what is n n is the all possible words because it will give the probability distribution across all the words n is on possible words pi is the probability of the ith word uh, actually normalized probability of the ith word and uh, now what happens if uh, uh, t is very high it results in more unpredictable and creative response so let's understand the mathematics let's say these are my final scores and if you see this scores adds up to one it can be unnormalized as well because the work of softmax is to normalize them but here i have given example 0 0.5 0 0.2 0 0.1 0 0.005 and 0 0.01 which can be seen as 50 percent 20 10 5 and 1 percent these are the let's say uh, scores for the words to appear next now when we apply a softmax with ignoring the t parameter let's say t is equal to 1 uh, these are the probabilities i get which is 30 percent for word 1 19.7 for word 2 17.5 for word 3 and so on but as soon as i reduce the temperature parameter the probability of the high highest weighted wala score bumps up it almost goes 98 percent while when i increase the temperature for uh, parameter value you can see the probability becomes more uh, equal for the word so what happens is that on increasing the temperature parameter we are penalizing the scores of each word and there is an exponentiation on top of it so uh, when we increase the temperature parameter all words kind of becomes uh, small and when the exponential act act on top of it it's not able to bump it a lot so we see that most of the scores are similar it is more creative that more words more type of words will have uh, the chance to occur why if my temperature is small what will happen it will bump up the highest score more and 
but since the there is a difference between scores exponentiation will bump it even more so increasing the temperature parameter makes the model output more diverse as it softens the probability distribution and allows lower probability tokens to more likely to be sampled while decreasing the temperature parameters further bumps up the uh, highest score and there is a difference or parity disbalance between the scores but if we increase the temperature par parameter all of them kind of become equal and there are more chances that any word can appear so that's how temperature parameter controls the creativity so finally let's look at the entire process end to end how uh, the response is generated using chat gpt once the user has given the prompt or a uh, message for example what is the weather like today the prompt is encoded into vector representation using a pre-trained language model because the machines can only deal with numbers. Each of the word will be converted into vector representation which we can also call as some embedding. The language model will generate the probability distribution over the vocabulary of words indicating the likelihood of each word being the next word in the response. Right? Now the temperature parameter will be applied depending on what is the level of randomness we want, right? If we want high randomness, the temperature will be high and if we want less randomness and more predictable, predictable and conservative response, the lower temperature we can use. Depending on this temperature parameter, the, the language model will sample a word uh, from the probability distribution based on the adjusted temperature value. The selected word becomes the next word in the generated response. Now this uh, sample word will become kind of input along with the uh, prompt which was the actual question what is the weather like today and context is what has been generated till now. The process of sampling and selecting words from the probability distribution continues till a specified length is reached or we have reached the termination token right till uh, one, uh, that point the generation or sampling will keep on happening that word will become the current input and next word next word so on that's why you would have seen ChatGPT produces output word one at a time yeah, one word at a time it keeps on producing. And that is how the generated response is decoded from its vector representation which is the number representation into human readable text and returned to the user which we get as an uh, output. So that's it in this video where we looked at the technology behind ChatGPT, how ChatGPT is trained using uh, on top of GPT model using three steps which is fine tuning, ranking the response and further uh, bettering the response using reinforcement learning uh, using the PPO which is proximal policy optimization process. Also, we looked at the temperature parameter, how it controls the creativity and we also looked at why GPT models are so powerful and they are called the foundation models. That's it in this video. There will be more videos on large language models uh, coming. So stay tuned and please uh, like and subscribe. Bye.